The First World War in 261 Weeks Follow the Great War from the shooting at Sarajevo on the 28th of June 1914 till the Treaty of Versailles on the 28th of June 1919. The story of the First World War, written by Tom Tucken and translated into English by Peter Veldman, is brought to life week after week for five years on end. 261 weeks, 261 lives, 261 stories. France Ferdinand had a ferry in trouble. Europe surprised by attack in Sarajevo. Sunday the 28th of June 1914, the beginning of the first week after the shooting in Sarajevo. German Emperor William II is getting ready for his annual cruise in Norwegian waters on the imperial yacht Hohenzollern. The French are under the spell of the lawsuit against Henriette Caillot, wife of the former Prime Minister, who killed a journalist that was a nuisance to a husband. In the Bosnian town of Sarajevo, there is an attack on the Austro-Hungarian successor to the throne, in which both he and his wife are killed. The perpetrator, the young Bosnian nationalist Gavrilo Princip, and his conspirators are arrested on site. Riots break out in Sarajevo and other parts of Bosnia. From Belgrade, the diplomatic service of Austria-Hungary announces to Vienna that the Serbians must be accessories to the attack. Also, the German foreign minister, Gottlieb von Jago, is informed that his Viennese colleague, Leopold von Berchtold, is pointing an accusing finger at Belgrade. The German emperor reacts stoically to all the news and his Austrian colleague, Franz Josef, is not exactly grief-stricken either. On their own country estate in Austrian Artstetten, the couple are laid to rest after a most plain ceremony, Sophie and Franz Ferdinand. The 28th of June 1914 is the day that the story of the First World War begins. To the Serbians, the 28th of June is a date with a much older history. Tucked away in time on the 28th of June 1389, Serbian armed forces were defeated by the army of the Ottoman Empire. The Battle of Kosovo Polje, the Field of Blackbirds, hurt the Serbian soul permanently. Franz Ferdinand should have chosen a better day in 1914 for his visit to Sarajevo. It is the relatively unknown capital of Bosnia and Herzegovina, where for centuries Muslims, Croatians and Serbians have had to live together. Franz Ferdinand, who bears the title of Archduke, is the future emperor of Austria-Hungary. To the annoyance of true Serbians, Bosnia and Herzegovina have also been part of this empire for six years. A visit to Sarajevo on the 28th of June is all in all an affront for which Franz Ferdinand is going to be sorry. The first shot of the First World War is fired on the 28th of June 1914, though no one will understand the significance. Franz Ferdinand and his wife Sophie are also celebrating their wedding day. They are sitting side by side in an open car when the young Bosnian Gavrilo Princip thinks he should do the Serbian nation a favour. Princip's main concern is Franz Ferdinand, who he considers the oppressor of the Serbian people. The second bullet is meant for Oskar Potiorek, governor of Bosnia and Herzegovina, who is also in the car. Princip misses the target and accidentally hits Sophie in the abdomen. She is said to have cried out to her husband, for God's sake, what has happened. Then she collapses between her husband's knees. After being hit in the carotid artery, he stutters, so full. So viel stirbt nicht, bleibe am Leben für unsere Kinder. Sophie, Sophie, don't die, stay alive for our children. While the Archduke himself is losing consciousness, he goes on repeating several times that it's nothing, as is nichts, 
Es ist nichts, es ist nichts. But the Archduke is profoundly mistaken. In the governor's residence, the death of both spouses is established. Let us return to the morning of 28th of June, 1914, when the world still looks completely different. Archduke Franz Ferdinand is the man to succeed the ancient emperor of the Austro-Hungarian double monarchy. The future emperor is reputed to be a reformer, and decaying Vienna is horrified by the thought that the status quo is about to end for the Austrians and Hungarians. Emperor Franz Josef is almost 84. He will, humanly spoken, not live much longer. At the age of 50, Franz Ferdinand of Austria Este, as is his title, is not exactly just out of the cradle. He has been warming up to the throne half of his life. In 1889, Crown Prince Rudolf committed suicide. Rudolf was the only son of Emperor Franz Josef and his ravishing but neurotic wife Elizabeth, better known as Sissy. After that, Franz Ferdinand's father came on the screen as the eldest brother of the Emperor, but Senior soon declined the hereditary honour. Consequently, Franz Ferdinand sees it as his task to continue the tradition of the Habsburgs as the central dynasty of Europe. Quite a task, as the future of the court in Vienna does not look very good. The Habsburg Empire and its ethnic communities are creaking and cracking everywhere. Franz Ferdinand, however, does not seem to be burdened with this prospect. He lives an impassioned life, travelling and hunting. He is said to have killed about 5,000 deer single-handedly in his life. Meanwhile, surrounded by advisers in the military chancellery of Castle Untere Belvedere, he is indeed preparing conscientiously for his task. Franz Ferdinand advocates modernization of the army and extension of the navy. He wants Austria-Hungary to regain its position on the world stage. First it should, however, put its domestic affairs in order. Franz Ferdinand does not share the desire to go to war, as shown by Chief of Staff Konrad von Hetzendorf, with regard to the ambitious kingdom of Serbia. His urge to reform provides him with a liberal image, but a good observer will recognize in Franz Ferdinand a reactionary, who wants to embed the monarchy in aristocracy, with his Catholic God's blessing, of course. For a time he has been willing to grant the Slav inhabitants of the empire their own status equal to the Austrians and the Hungarians, but in the final year of his life he is inclined towards a United States of Great Austria, consisting of 15 member states. He must certainly distrust the Magyars who were treated equally. He sees their nationalist sentiments as a threat to the dynasty. Franz Ferdinand cannot tolerate Hungarian being spoken in his presence. Historian Michael Freund has called Franz Ferdinand a man of uninspired energy, of dark appearance and emotions, exuding an aura of strangeness and casting a shadow of violence and ruthlessness. Contemporary Austrian writer and satirist Karl Kraus observed that Franz Ferdinand was not the type of person to greet somebody else. He does not feel the urge to venture on the unexplored grounds that in Vienna is called heart. His own heart was stolen in 1859 by one Sophie Gotek. As Duchess of Hohenberg, she is of rather humble birth. Czech aristocracy come down. Emperor Franz Josef, who is not at all fond of his self-willed nephew, does not accept the relationship. A future Habsburg emperor should present a lady of his own class. The quarrel between the emperor and his successor culminates to such an extent that William II of Germany and Nicholas II of Russia call upon their Viennese equal to be a bit more accommodating. In 1899, Franz Josef is willing to agree with the marital union, but he wants it to be a morganetic marriage. Children of such a left-handed marriage should content themselves with the title of the lowest-born marital partner. In other words, Franz Ferdinand will not be able to beget an heir to the throne by his Sophie, and at official occasions Sophie will have to know her position somewhere 
at the back. The emperor's entourage, including both Franz Ferdinand's brothers, will see to it that the dynastic discipline is respected. As Oberhofmeister, High Chamberlain, Alfred, the second prince of Montenuevo, does not pass any chance to deny Sophie the dignity of the Habsburg court. Franz Ferdinand hates him for this. Sophie accepts all the insults in a dignified manner. Her serenity contrasts with the impulsive nature of her husband. As Bosnia and Herzegovina are a Reichsland, imperial territory, Sophie is allowed to sit next to her husband for a change on the 28th of June 1914. Franz Ferdinand has come to Bosnia to inspect the troops, a task which he has fulfilled for some years. To the Serbians, this is a fateful sign. The tension between the small kingdom of Serbia and the big Danube monarchy has been so great for years that you can cut it with a knife. Bosnia is the center. The Serbians see the army maneuvers there as a sign that Austria-Hungary is about to invade and advance to Belgrade. Today, this is certainly not on the program in Sarajevo, but there will be a visit to the town hall, a speech by the mayor, the opening of the new accommodation of the National Museum, luncheon in the Konak, the old Turkish fortress, and visits to the mosque and the bazaars. Sophie is convinced that it is going to be an enjoyable day. Wherever we went, we were treated in such a friendly fashion, even by all Serbians, with so much cordiality and genuine warmth, she said on the day before they left for Sarajevo. However, when Franz Ferdinand and Sophie are driving along the Appel Quay, there is a muffled bang. The young typographer Nedelko Kabrinovic throws a bomb to the car of the Archduke. It is a conspiracy. They are seven, Kabrinovic, Princip, and five others. The bomb Kabrinovic throws misses its target. It rolls off the folding roof of the car after Franz Ferdinand has made a defensive gesture with his hand to protect his Sophie. Two officers in the car following the Archduke get the full blast. Several bystanders are injured by fragments of the bomb. Rather outraged than shocked, Franz Ferdinand decides to continue his visit. In the town hall he snores at the mayor, I have come to Sarajevo and people throw bombs at me. It is a disgrace. Sophie pacifies him, after which Franz Ferdinand is said to have mumbled, huh, I'm sure bullets will be next. When Franz Ferdinand decides to go to the hospital to pay a visit to the people injured in the bomb attack, Gavrilo Princip, loitering by the side of the road, sees his opportunity. The car has to turn to go in the right direction, with his gun, Princip then finishes his comrade's job. In Vienna, old friends Joseph, a dutiful but fossilized monarch, can heave a sigh of relief. The future of his dynasty will look much brighter without obstinate Franz Ferdinand. Even when dead, Sophie still has to know her position. Her coffin is placed on a lower pedestal than her husband's. Two handkerchiefs and a fan are laid on it, as a reminder of her modest position as lady-in-waiting. Foreign princes are not invited for the funeral. In his lifetime, Franz Ferdinand had determined that he and his wife Sophie were not to be buried in the Capuzina Gruft in Vienna, where all highly placed Habsburgs are laid to eternal rest. He had his own light and airy crypt built in his palace at Archstetten. In the dead of night, the lifeless bodies are taken away from Vienna to the couple's country estate. At Pechlaren, they have to take the ferry across the Danube. There is a thunderstorm. The ferry narrowly escaped capsizing. So viel, so viel. Stirb nicht, bleibe am Leben für unsere Kinder. Franz Ferdinand was rightly worried, for the Habsburg family will be unconcerned about the three orphans. A hunting friend of Franz Ferdinand takes over their upbringing, and when the National Socialists come to power in Germany and Austria to be on the safe side, both sons of Franz Ferdinand and Sophie are locked up in Dachau concentration camp. Next week, William II. 
Want to know more about this podcast, which will run for five years? Go to the First World War in 261 Weeks dot com. My name is Tom Tucken. I hope you enjoyed this episode.